So uh, we are talking about prostatic joint infection and uh, Vikas mentioned that the prostatic joint infection is number, number one reason in your country for revision. Uh, in Germany and in the European Union, uh, prostate joint infection is not number one. It is maybe number three or number four. The most uh, revisions we perform for uh, aseptic loosening or dislocation or uh, periprostatic fracture. And number three or number four is the prostate joint infection. It's very important to think about the possibility of prostate joint infection. And if it's the number one reason in your country, then it is not so difficult to think about it. But if it's number three or number four, and you say, I am a perfect surgeon, I have never septic cases. There are such surgeons in Europe and they say, I have never uh, septic uh, cases. You have to think about the possibility. When you have a patient with a perfect implant, it is uh, well implanted, everything is correct. Uh, there's no dislocation, no loosening, but the patient has uh, complaints like pain, and the leading symptom is always the pain. Especially two years after primary surgery, you have to think about uh, the possibility of prostate joint infection. The other clinical signs are not so reliable, so the most important uh, sign is the pain. A fever or uh, any signs of inflammation or any local signs of inflammation are, are not so common and not so reliable. The most reliable uh, sign of infection is the pain. And when you have a painful joint, artificial joint, like total hip or total knee, I know this is in this uh, meeting, we are talking about the hip mainly, but I will uh, talk about both joints, okay? If you agree about hips and knees, because um, Many of you deal with also, also with, with hips and knees. So the diagnosing of prostate joint infection is based on the history, physical examination, blood tests, but most importantly, the synovial analysis. And uh, when you go, go for blood tests, we check the CRP. Of course, you can also check the sedimentation rate. But uh, at this moment, we have no single test which can prove the prostate joint infection. So there is no test with 100% sensitivity and specificity. That's why you have to use a panel of diagnostic tools. And the most important thing is the aspiration. This is a short video. Can you see the video? Yes, we can. Uh, yeah. Okay. So this is a short video about the aspiration. And we will show also how to use the Sinova Shure test, but it's not the most important thing in this video, the Sinova Shure, but it is more important to see how meticulous uh, the surgeon works in order to avoid a contamination with sterile, sterile uh, prepping, sterile gown, sterile gloves, sterile syringe, of course, and to perform the aspiration in a sterile environment. Then you go for the tests, you can do the Sinova Shure test if it's available. In Germany, it's available. I don't know if it's available in India, but um, it is a quite a good test because you have an, more than 95% uh, sensitivity and specificity for prostate joint infection, and you need only two drops of the synovial fluid uh, to carry out the bedside test, which is quite good uh, to uh, rule out Infection, if it's positive, it could be infection, but to be honest, it can be also um, metal on metal wear, for instance, or any particle wear. So if it's negative, you can be quite, quite sure it's not an infection and not an inflammation. If it's positive, you have to analyze other parameters. Uh, the leukocyte esterase test, which is carried out here in this video, it's very easy and very cheap to carry out, and uh, you can find the positive cases uh, with uh, quite a good uh, sensitivity and sens sensitivity. The cell count is very important. If you have a good lab, you have to go for the cell count and uh, the polymorphonuclear percentage. The consensus meeting of Philadelphia, uh, it was a big topic to discuss about the cell count analysis. Uh, and we have the threshold at 3,000 uh, cells per microliter and 80% uh, polymorphonuclear percentage. And this is very important to, to see this number because if you have granulocytes, more than 80%, 
regardless the number of the cells, so it could be also 2,000, but if you have 85% granulocytes, it's most likely it's an infection. So you have to look on both the cell count, absolute number of, of the cells, the leukocytes and the granulocytes. If you have a high cell count and a high percentage of polymorph or nuclear cells, you can be quite sure it's an infection. We have investigated differences between different joints. We had uh, 255 hips and 269 knees, and we saw uh, some differences. And we saw that the threshold for this infection is lower in the knee and higher in the hip. I don't know the reason why. Maybe the hip is uh, in the deeper layers and there's more soft tissue coverage. Whatever the reason, but in our series, we had a lower threshold for knees and a higher threshold for hips, and also a lower threshold for the polymorph or nuclear percentage. So in Europe, we have the tendency to go with the granulocytes down to a percentage of 60%. So you have more than 60% uh, granulocytes, it is an infection in both hips and knees. Uh, Again, in the Philadelphia consensus meeting, we had a threshold of 80%. The leukocyte esteras test is a, is a uh, bedside test. It's very easy, very cheap to carry out. I showed you in the video, and you have um, sensitivity of 100% and specificity of 96%, meaning that if you have a, a negative test, you can be quite, quite sure that it is not an infection. If it's positive, you have to consider other uh, inflammatory disease like rheumatoid disease or gout or um, particle wear or metal on metal problems, trulianosis whatsoever. But if it's negative, you can be quite sure it is not an inflammation, not a um, prostatic joint infection. Of course, if you have the possibility to use alpha defensin, then it is a very, very uh, strong tool because regardless of the organism, regardless of the gram type, regardless of the virulence of the organism, you are able to show the infection with a sensitivity and specificity for 96 of 97%. Uh, if you have the possibility to use the ELISA test in the lab, it's even better. We have point of care tests for heart attack, for pregnancy, for HIV, now we have also the uh, bedside test uh, for the alpha defensin. This is the Sinovashur test. Uh, here you can see the sensitivity is not as high as for the lab test with the ELISA, but the specificity is quite high. So if you need it in the office, uh, you can rule out infection, of course. That you need some accumulation of um, the alpha defensin, which is a protein is produced by the leukocytes uh, in the presence of bacteria. So you need some accumulation in the joint in order to be able to detect the alpha defensin in the joint. That's why it's not a good idea to, perf to perform the Sinovashur test in uh, draining sinus, because if you have a draining sinus, then the, the fluid, the synovial fluid is running out of the joint and you have no accumulation of the alpha defensin. To be honest, if you have a sinus, you don't need a fancy test like Sendovashur and anything else because a, sin, a, a draining sinus is a prostatic joint infection in 100% of the cases. So when you go back to the question which tests are to be done, uh, I recommend to do these tests, so first of all, culture, because you want to know the bug. And as Vic has mentioned, if you don't know the bug, it's difficult to perform a single-stage revision, but it's also difficult to carry out a two-stage revision, because it's always easier to, to treat the patient uh, targeted if you, don't, if you don't, uh, do know the, the bug. The treatment options are much better, both locally and systemically. So culture is, is a very, very uh, important uh, issue. And the leukocyte esterase as a bedside test, which is cheap and uh, you can do it uh, in any country of the world. The cell count with the granulocyte percentage, when you have a good lab background, you can do that and uh, it is very useful. The CRP is of course a, a must uh, to detect the, the blood, but you have to be aware of uh, CRP because there is 
there are 20% of the patients with the proven PG, PGI who have a normal CRP. So only 80% of the patients with PGI have an elevated CRP. So if the CRP is negative, it, it, it means uh, nothing. So it is one of the options, but uh, you have to go for an, uh, other options to prove. And if it's available, then you can use alpha difference in ELISA or the Sinovashur test. So how to diagnose the PGI? You have several steps and several options. First, when you have the suspicion with a painful joint, you go for aspiration and serum lab test. Of course, after x-ray, but physical examination and x-ray is baseline. So first aspiration and serum lab test. If you are lucky, you will find the bug and you will find the positive um, CRP and cell count and all these things. But it's only 60% of the patients in Germany. In 40% for of the patients, uh, you don't find anything, but you have still the suspicion for prostatic joint infection. In these cases, uh, I asked the patient to um, present uh, in two weeks again. So after you go for two weeks of uh, culturing at, after the first aspiration. If, if you didn't find anything, but you still have the suspicion, you go for a second aspiration uh, as earliest two weeks after the first one. And you do, you repeat everything, you do the same. And you will find another 10 to 20% of the patients uh, with infection, but you will still have 20%, you find nothing. You find no germ, you find no uh, proof for the infection. In these cases, we go for open biopsy. And in the hips, it's, it makes sense to go for open biopsy. In the knees, you can also do an arthroscopy, but you need five cultures, you need five uh, tissue samples from the joint uh, and two histologies. So you go for both histology and microbiology workup from the biopsy. And if you don't find anything, you have no uh, bug at this point, then you go for two stage revision or explantation uh, because the patient has pains, you have uh, no other options for diagnostic and it's easier to uh, remove everything, to get a lot of tissue samples from the joint and then go for um, second stage revision after uh, uh, the working up the diagnostics. Uh, there is no uh, reason to do a third aspiration or fourth aspiration. So this is the um, most reasonable workup of diagnostic in the PGI. And of course, when you have the diagnostics, you have to work together with your microbiologist specialist because you're a good surgeon, but you are not smart enough to understand the bugs, to understand the antibiotics, to understand a lot of things, the response of the body, the response of the bacteria. So I recommend to work together with a microbiologist or an infectious disease specialist because together you're a successful team. And then you have to make the right, the right decision. What kind of surgery should I perform? Is it an early infection? Is it a late infection? Uh, do we need uh, one stage revision or two stage revision? Uh, do we need antibiotics? Which antibiotics to use in the cement? Which antibiotics to uh, use in an IV line? And so on. So we have a good publication from the endoclinic by Dr. Frommelt. This is my uh, colleague from this hospital where I am working now. Uh, this is Professor Rusman, who is a very well-known microbiologist. We work together, and we, I always have a recommendation from his team for my patients to treat. Coming back to the Philadelphia uh, consensus meeting, where we had um, a new recommendation to use a scoring system for the diagnosis. And uh, in the previous 2013, uh, Philadelphia consensus meeting, we had also minor criteria and major criteria, major criteria when you have two times the same bug or you have a draining sinus. So there is no doubt there's an infection. But in the most cases, you don't have uh, the major criteria fulfilled, but you have the minor criteria. And in the last meeting, 2018, we suggested to use the scoring system. And um, when you have more than six points, it's an infection. When you have less than three points, it's not an infection. And when you have four or five points, 
It could be an infection, but it could be also uh, something else. So it is very useful to, to use this um, scoring system. And of course, you have to go for a CRP or D-dimer. You have to go for a sedimentation rate. You have to go for aspiration of the joint with the cell count or leukocyte esterase or positive alpha defensin. So you have options here to evaluate the synovial fluid uh, in any country of the world. You have one of these items. Uh, the same with the polymorphonuclear percentage with the granulocytes and culture and histology and the visible prurence of fluid. You know, prurence can also be a sterile joint with the metal or metal um, bearing surface, for instance. There are several scenarios which are interesting. So in this case, you have an elevated CRP uh, with an elevated, elevated cell count and you have a positive culture. So this is a straightforward case. You have 10 points. Uh, it's clear and PGI, no doubt. You have some difficult cases where you have a normal CRP. As I mentioned, 80% of the PGI patients have an ele elevated CRP, but 20% can be normal. You have an elevated granulocyte. Uh, you have no uh, positive culture, but the alpha defensin is positive. So is it an infection or is it not? You have, not, uh, you have less than six points. So the recommendation is to repeat the workup, to go for second aspiration. It could be, for instance, a metal on metal surface. You, so you have to test, you have to check the x-ray, you have to check the implant. Is it a metal on metal bearing? Is it possible to have a metal on metal reaction? Maybe you have to go for an MRI to see the pseudo tumor in this case. So further uh, workup is needed. The other case, other difficult case, you have a normal CRP, you have an elevated uh, cell count, but the granulocyte percentage is normal, culture is negative, three points. It's also quite straightforward because it is not an infection. You have uh, no elevated granulocytes, no positive culture, no elevated CRP. It could be maybe uh, aseptic loosening. Sedimentation is elevated and the cell count is elevated, but the granulocytes are normal. It could be... Um, a rheumatoid arthritis, excuse me, this is my phone, could be a rheumatoid arthritis or any other inflammatory disease or uh, aseptic loosening whatsoever. And, and so on and so on. I don't want to, uh, maybe the contamination is interesting. I don't want to uh, talk too much about this, but it's quite interesting to, to, to play with this scoring system. And maybe contamination is interesting because sometimes you have a positive culture, but everything else is negative. In these cases, you have to consider uh, another workup because it could be a contamination. And in some, in some cases, uh, we have nothing. Patient has pains. We have a positive culture, but everything else is negative. It's a very difficult decision to say, is it an infection or not? Is it a contamination or not? what to do. In these cases, I recommend to repeat the whole workup. And to be honest, we are good guys. We are smart guys and we are skilled guys, but sometimes we have to make decision alone and this is not always uh, easy. And when it's about our own patient, our complication, uh, it is not so easy to be honest to, each, to, to, to yourself. And that's why it's very useful to have a meeting on a regular basis with your colleagues. Uh, part of the meeting is the microbiologist, the infectious disease specialist, nurses, pharmacologists, uh, radi radiologists, whatsoever. The bigger the team, the better it is. And you can discuss your, your findings, you can discuss your plan, how to treat the patient. And then you can follow your treatment algorithm this to, to, briefly our treatment algorithm first we have to know is the uh, joint infected yes or no uh, when it is infected uh, do we know about the bugs do we know the organism yes or no if no then we go for two stage if yes then we have to know about the virulence is it a highly virulent uh, germ uh, difficult to treat then to go for two stage if it's easy to treat, go for single stage. If uh, 
the patient, if, if it's an early infection, the, sta the implant is stable, we know the germ, then we go for there. So it's quite easy. Of course, there you have some cases where you cannot do a big surgery. The patient cannot be operated too old, too uh, sick whatsoever. Then you have to go for long-term antibiotic suppression, but I don't want to talk about this. You have also some cases where you have to make uh, an intraoperative decision and you need some intraoperative diagnostics. After the workup, you have also the possibility of uh, intraoperative um, diagnostics. Frozen section, it's not available everywhere, uh, not available in endoclinic, uh, not available in many, many hospitals. In my actual hospital in Berlin, it's available, but it's not always easy to, to organize. Leukocyte esterite strips are every, uh, available everywhere, so I recommend to use this in the theater. Sinovashur, it's good and available in some countries, but not all countries, and it's quite expensive. So when you need a quick decision, you go for leukocyte esterase in theater. Of course, when you go for um, sampling, you need always more samples. I always say um, three or five samples for culture and two samples for histology. Uh, are sufficient. Swaps, we don't do swaps because they have a high uh, false positive, false negative percentage. And sometimes you have also cases like this. This is a total knee replacement uh, from the endoclinic, which was a revision. And quite soon the patient developed some osteolysis here and here, as you can see. And then the dislocation of, um, of the femoral component and uh, osteolysis of the medial condyle and the loosening of the femoral, uh, femoral component. And uh, it was quite uh, quick after surgery. And we, asked, we did an aspiration and you can see it's like a pus, it's like creamy pus. But leukocyte esterase was negative and Sinovashur was negative. And culture was also negative. So we went for uh, aseptic revision on the femoral side, no septic revision because it was uh, not an infection, but it was a reaction, granul granulomatous uh, reaction on the cement or any other reaction. Uh, we, revived, we did a revision on the femoral side with uh, trabecular metal cones and uh, implant, a hinge implant but it was not an infection. But sometimes you have pus like this, creamy pus in the joint, and it's not an infection. It's very seldom, but it happens. So when you have cases like this, it is reasonable to go for culture from the retrieve implants because there are some bugs you can only detect from the biofilm, from the surface of the implant. And in doubtful cases, you go for this, and uh, then you have the possibility of uh, sonication. Uh, the sonication is a method when you can put the whole implant into the water bath and to release the biofilm from the surface of the implant with um, ultrasonic device and then you can detect 99% um, of, the, of the germs. So you have to retrieve the implant, put it in a sterile box and send it to the lab. So this is, this is an option that we use in Germany for intraoperative uh, uh, detection of, of the bugs. So this is the diagnostics. Now we go for the treatment options. We, as I mentioned, uh, we have several treatment options. In the early infection, you can go for a DARE. If you have an acute hematogenous infection where the symptoms are not longer than 30 days back, uh, or you have an early positive joint infection in the early phase of the primary implantation. Uh, if you have the implantation not longer than 30 days back. So this is an early infection. Everything else is a, is a late infection. Everything beyond 30 days, doesn't matter if it's acute hematogenous or early PGI, it's a late infection. And then you, go, you don't go for there. So in the early timing, you can go for there, which means debridement. So you open up the joint, you uh, remove the um, polyethylene and you remove the, the femoral head, 
you may you remove everything which can be removed easily and um, the modular implants and then you debride the joint you wash out with uh, six liters of antiseptic solution like uh, polyhexanate solution or iodine or uh, vinegar solution whatsoever some antiseptic solution and then you go back with the new implants new uh, modular implants like new polyethylene liner new femoral head and uh, close the wound which is very important you close the wound so there is no open uh, wound therapy for there no back therapy or anything else with open therapy and then you go for uh, antibiotic treatment uh, very important that you have solid implants and no bone loss so it's only for the early cases and of course it's a question of time so you have to make the decision very quick and it has to be a um, short period with symptoms after onset of the symptoms in the hematogenous uh, infection or a short time less than 30 days after primary implantation everything else is a late infection and everything else needs a stage revision even the single stage revision is a stage revision because you do two operations in one session so you don't forget one stage is also a stage revision like uh, like two stage but in one session which one is better? Of course, uh, it's a question of uh, belief, it's a question of tradition, it's a question of your education, it's a question of uh, the patient's uh, intention, and uh, it's a question of money, of course. So if you are a good surgeon, you can do both. You can do one stage, you can do two stage. Which one is better? Uh, I like the one stage more, but uh, in the literature you can see, you can read a lot of papers for one or other uh, surgery um, you can see here a patient walking several days after one stage revision climbing the stairs only several days three four five days after surgery so when you ask him which one is better, one stage or two stage, he will say one stage is fantastic because he can walk, he can climb stairs, he has no limitations. And when you compare this guy with the patients with a spacer, it's a huge difference. So when you ask me which one is better, I tell to you one stage is better. If you read the literature, you can see there are no big differences. Both methods in Europe, at least, have success rates something about 90 percent for both in this paper of george which was uh, published 2016 it was a systematic review with a lot of papers and um, there was no superiority of uh, two stage or one stage over the other method in the two stage you have to consider you have a good infection control you have the possibility to make two debridements you have the possibility to clean up the joint two times, two surgeries, but also the drawbacks of two surgery. Uh, you have to consider maybe the patient is too ill, too sick, too old for two surgeries. And if you have one possibility to help the patient, it is maybe better for uh, her or him. And uh, that's why we recommend to do one stage in uh, the most cases. It is also cost effective, of course, one surgery is cheaper than two surgeries and um, it's getting more, more and more popular worldwide. Uh, it was only the endoclinic and some other hospitals, right in the hospital and some centers uh, also in India and France, in Paris to go for one stage. But now it's getting more and more and even in the United States, uh, there are more surgeons starting with one stage because they see it's reasonable. It's cost effective, patients like it, surgeons like it. And of course you have some uh, possibilities to do so. In the endoclinic, this is, when you have been in the endoclinic, you can recognize this is the septic uh, theater, theater number one, where I was always uh, operating my patients. And um, also in the endoclinic, we operate not all the patients with one stage, but uh, 85 to 90% of them. And 10 to 15% we have to go for two stage because we don't know the germ. 
So the indication for one stage in my eyes is to have the positive joint infection with a non-germ. It should be a normal, straightforward germ, not difficult to treat, uh, not very highly uh, resistant or highly uh, aggressive. So I don't like enterococci, for instance, but uh, staphylococci, MRSE is a possibility. And uh, P. Acnes, so you can do a lot of germs with one stage when you know them and when you have the susceptibility. And the bone stock is reasonable and the white and the soft tissues are reasonable. In this case, you have a, a PGI on the right hip with an uncemented modular stem, titanium stem, which was uh, quite solid. In this case, we did an um, osteotomy, longitudinal um, osteotomy. Uh, to remove the stem and go for a cemented um, stem one stage and the patient uh, was doing well. All the other cases you have to do for two stage because you don't know the germ, you don't know uh, antibiotic therapy um, or if you have a soft tissue situation with a sinus or some defect or bad soft tissue quality then you go for two stage. And in these cases, I use this kind of spacer in the hip, which looks like, an imp looks like a total hip replacement, but it isn't. It is a um, uh, cement coated polyethylene liner from the dual mobility cup and um, that, uh, a liberately, um, how to say that, um, a poor cementing technique for the stem with a lot of antibiotic loaded bone cement around. And this is my space I'm using and the patients are very happy and they can walk quite without any um, limitation. In the knees, we use this kind of spacers. And um, of course, in the, in the two stage, you have to consider when to go for reimplantation because um, in many cases, you don't know if the patient is free of infection. And we consider the patient free of infection when you have no clinical signs of infection, no fever, no pain, no local signs, the wound looks okay, the stitches are removed, the soft tissues are recovered, there is no, not a big inflammation, the CRP is back to baseline, and then we consider the patient for free of infection, and then we go for the reimplantation. We don't go for aspiration, we don't go for bone scan, we don't go for alpha defensin or any other tests. In the regular time, six weeks after explantation with a spacer, you can go for reimplantation. In this case, uh, it is not a good case for one stage, of course, because you have a big defect and the draining sinus. So in this case, I wouldn't go for one stage. Uh, first, I would remove everything, go for a gastrocremius flap, and after that, I would go for the reimplantation. Uh, also, in this case, you have a chronic osteomyelitis, post-traumatic infection. We have no, no bugs in this case. You, have, you can see the old antibiotic uh, beads. And, uh, of course, in this case, you have to go for uh, open biopsy, remove the hardware, go for diagnostics, uh, resect the bone, which is uh, chronically inflamed, and there's osteomyelitis, and then um, you go for the implantation with an antibiotic loaded bone cement and uh, mega prosthesis. When you go back to the literature and see the results of one stage, it's quite encouraging. We had also a follow-up of 70 patients, the biggest series, one of the biggest series, uh, and with a reasonable follow-up of 10 years uh, with 91.5% per success rate. This is uh, as good as with a two-stage revision, so we are quite confident to perform the, two, the one stage. Which, which patient to select for one stage revision? Also a good question because the most patients want to go for one stage and ask you to do so, but not all of them fit, uh, are fit for the one stage revision. So the patient has to be uh, motivated. You, know, you need to know the germ and the susceptibility. Um, you, the patient has to be fit for local and systemic antibiotic therapy. So if the patient has a kidney failure, you have to consider if you can use vancomycin in a high dose 
a systemic uh, manner because the patient has a um, uh, higher risk for, for renal failure, for kidney failure. So in these cases, you have to discuss with your infectious disease specialist if the patient is fit for that. But uh, <clears throat> a poor general condition is not an exclusion criterion for me for the one stage revision um, because these patients are really need only one surgery and this one surgery has to be successful uh, uh, because these patients cannot be operated several times. So coming back to the treatment options, what are the key steps of the one stage septic exchange? And uh, when you have been in the endoclinic and when uh, you saw the uh, debridement in the theater, the radicality and the aggressive debridement, my friend uh, told me it's a maniac debridement. Um, sorry, sorry, I have to answer the phone. Herr Phoebe? Ich melde mich gleich. Ich, bin, ich sitze jetzt in einem Webinar. Ich melde mich gleich. Ne? Ach so, ich kann jetzt nicht. Ja, tschüss. Sorry. Um, so the, the radicality and the aggressive debridement are the most important steps to debride the soft tissues and the bone uh, to wash out the particles, to wash out the bugs with the pulsatile jet lavage and the local antiseptic solution. And then to redrape, re scrub, use new instruments and go for the reimplantation in the second part. Now I will show you some pictures of the knee. I know you are most of them, most of you are uh, hip surgeons, but you can see here a knee with the approach. Here's how to mobilize the implant, which is solid. You use a power saw to mobilize the implant and the cement interface to remove the solid implant. <clears throat> And then you can use chisels and power saws to remove the implant from the bone without any bone loss. And when you are lucky and uh, you were meticulous and uh, not too aggressive with your chisel, then you can remove the implant with uh, any massive bone loss. And uh, this is how to mobilize. Of course, you need special, special instruments. Uh, and then you can tap it out with this kind of device. Okay, now it's removed and there you can see there is no bone loss. Then you can go for the debridement to remove the membrane, uh, debride the bone with the power saw to freshen up the surface, to remove the membranes, to remove the bugs. In the same in the hip, after removal of the implant, you have to remove the, the cement. When you have cement inside, uh, all the cement particles may have uh, a biofilm membrane and bugs on the surface. So it is mandatory to remove all the cement, all the foreign material. I prefer to do, do it in the endomedular way, not to do uh, ETO. Of course, if you have a lot of cement and it's difficult to remove from proximal, from the uh, endomedullary uh, way, then you have to go for ETO to remove the implant, remove the cement, remove all hardware in order to debride. But I try to remove, try to avoid ETO in the most cases. You need special chisels, special burrs, special instruments to remove the cement but it's very important. Then you debride the bone after removing all the hardware or the cement, you debride the bone and uh, you, you clean up the surface. Of course, in the knee, you have to debride the posterior aspect of the knee as well, which is a little bit dangerous, but it's uh, important to debride the, door, the posterior capsule and uh, the bone, the proximal tibia, the distal femur. And then you use your jet lavage to wash out with local antiseptic solution and um, remove all the small particles, cement particles and bacteria. You can use uh, several, you have several options for uh, antiseptic solutions. I prefer using uh, the 0.05% polyhexanate solution 
uh, three or three to six liters of them with a jet lavage. And then you can see it's very clean uh, macroscopically and microbiologically. You can see the posterior aspect of the knee, the posterior capsule, which was uh, debrided. As I mentioned, it's uh, dangerous because of the popliteal vessels, but uh, if you are familiar with the technique, you can do that quite um, easily. And it's important to remove all the synovial membrane from all over the knee, uh, even on the posterior aspect. As I mentioned, uh, you go for um, a new setup, in the one stage, sometimes also in the two stage, uh, intraoperatively, you can change your instruments to clean instruments. You can do a redraping. You can change the lamp handles, the suction tips, and uh, new gown, new uh, gloves in order to minimize the contamination. In the total knee replacement, you go then for a reimplantation with rotating hinge implant. We prefer using the cemented implants. We prefer using the hinge in the knee because it's a good choice for the prosthetic joint infection. Why? Because you debride a lot, you remove all the soft tissues around the knee, only the extensor apparatus is remaining, and the hinge is a good choice for intrinsic stability of the knee. Uh, when you have a bone loss, you can use also metal augments. We don't use bone grafts in the septic revision, but we use um, these trabecular metal cones or any other metal cones. Um, also, doesn't matter if it's titanium or um, structures, metal augments are very useful to restore the joint line and to restore the bone stock. Antibiotic load bone cement is very important to use. Uh, also, when you use uncemented implants, you can combine it with uh, an antibiotic loaded bone cement, in this case, to coat the implant and the release of the antibiotics from the cement can provide a high concentration of uh, antibiotics in the joint. You can cover the whole implant. This is a uh, total femoral replacement and uh, it was covered with antibiotic loaded bone cement in order to provide a high concentration of antibiotics. We always discard the antibiotics both locally and systemically with the um, uh, microbiologist. This is Dr. Frommelt. I was working with many for many, many years in the endoclinic. The standard uh, antibiotic load, uh, loaded bone cement we are using is uh, the um, Copal. Uh, which has uh, two options, Copal G and C, where you have one gram of gentamicin and one gram of clindamycin. Uh, or the other option is the G and V, you have uh, 0.5 gentamicin and two grams of vancomycin. You can uh, even add antibiotics to these um, manufactured antibiotic loaded bone cements based on the susceptibility, based on your recommendation from the microbiologist when I have uh, this kind of cement, gentamicin, clindamycin, PMMA, then I add uh, two grams of vancomycin, or when I have this one, I can add two grams of uh, meropenem based on the susceptibility. The duration of antibiotic treatment is depending on the kind of revision. When you go for one stage revision and you have a lot of antibiotic loaded bone cement in the bone, then you, you are allowed to go for a short term antibiotic treatment. When you go for one stage and you have no antibiotic loaded cement in the joint, then you have to go for six weeks of antibiotics. In the two stage, you have a long time antibiotics explantation with antibiotics, six weeks, and then reimplantation with bone cement, two weeks without bone cement, six weeks. So it depends, the duration of antibiotic treatment it depends on the kind of revision you performed. In there, we recommend to go for antibiotic treatment for three months. This is also a very nice case with a total knee replacement with a rupture of the extensor mechanism, a lot of hardware, or bad soft tissues, uh, and it was operated at one stage, uh, reconstruction of the joint line, 
reconstruction of the bone defects. You can see nice central patella alignment and antibiotic bone cement. The patient uh, had only a very small amount of extension leg, but was able to, to walk without crutches, uh, even after this quite big disaster in the knee. Sometimes you have uh, very, very bad cases like this. This is all the, 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 um, on the limit of uh, one stage revision. This guy was from the United States with a big defect, no extensor mechanism, uh, infection, of course, long uncemented modular implants, but he wanted to have one stage. It is not reasonable to go for one stage in this case. Of course, I would go for two stage in this case, but this guy wanted to ask us for a one stage revision and we did it. So this is the implant. It's very, very hard to remove. As you can see, a lot of cement, long stems, bone loss, bad soft tissue. So this is really crazy to go for one stage, but he wanted to do that. So we removed all the implant, we removed the infection, we debrided, and then we replaced the knee with a, more, with a mega implant, coated with antibiotic load with bone cement, very long stems, with plastic surgery, of course, and with a uh, orthesis because the extensor mechanism didn't work, but the patient wanted to do like this, and this is also the, the last possibility to help this patient. When you have no extensor mechanism, you can go for uh, allografting, but not in the septic uh, setup. Maybe later, uh, six months after septic revision, you can replace the patella uh, with a graft, like in this case we did. But to be honest, these are very, very uh, big surgeries with a high complication rate something about uh, 15 to 20%. But in some cases, you can do this and you can help the patient to regain the mobility. So one stage is a good option for patient and surgeon. You have less mortality, morbidity, uh, but you need a uh, very radical debridement. The advantage is that you need a shorter period of time for antibiotic treatment. You have lower costs. In 90%, you need no second look surgery. It's only one surgery. It is as effective as two stage. Uh, you have no impairment with the spacer and that's why we like it. Of course, there are some drawbacks, uh, but if you are trained and if you can do uh, a good uh, debridement, you will be successful. Sometimes you, need a, you have a bolus with the infection, which is quite challenging, like in these cases with the Paprosky 3A defect. And then you have to uh, treat the infection and treat the bone loss in the meantime. Like in this case, 72 millimeters of defect, you need big jumbo cups, but trabecular metal is a good option because you can use this shell without cement. You can use screws to fill the defect. And then uh, you can go for uh, cementation inside the shell use antibiotic loaded bone cement, and then you can combine with the cemented implant and you can also treat the bone loss. Of course, you have to know your limits. Not everything is possible with the septic uh, revision when you have cases like this, uh, several operations before, uh, spacer didn't work, very bad soft tissues, uh, you have to remove the spacer, you have to remove a lot of soft tissues, you have to remove a lot of bone. The bone quality is very bad, the blood supply is very bad. You have to resect the extension mechanism. In these cases, you have to go for atrodesis or amputation, above knee amputation. Uh, nobody is happy. In the young patient, above knee amputation is maybe better. In the older patient, atrodesis is maybe better because the life with a stiff knee, with an arthrodesis knee is not so nice. Uh, but we use these kind of devices which are uh, cemented and uh, there is a good stability for the arthrodesis. So to sum up, the diagnosis is challenging, but you have several options to have a perfect uh, diagnostic setup. 
um, you need several modalities. One method is not enough, so you have to go for aspiration, blood test, lab test, microbiology, and so on. Uh, when you have a multidisciplinary approach, you will be more successful and you will be more happy with your uh, treatment options and with your patients. For acute infections, you want to use the DARE, but the limit, time limit is 30 days. Uh, the gold standard is still two-stage revision. You can do it always, but in selected pa cases, selected patients, you can do the single-stage revision, as I mentioned, and uh, patients will love it. You will love it when you are successful. For complex cases, it is better to have tertiary tertia referral centers. It, not, it is not everyone's surgery, so when you have the possibility to... to put the patients in a big center um, and have more cases to deal with, maybe it's a better treatment option for your country. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for the invitation.